Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the finale of this year's Design to Manufacturing Conference. We just wrapped up a block of fantastic breakout sessions from our team of Hawkridge Systems presenters, who covered everything from 3D printing and improved motorcycle airbox to the latest SolidWorks features for designing steel structures. One of those sessions was Mark Pimenthal's Power Hour update on recent changes in computer-aided manufacturing sponsored by CamWorks. For those who aren't familiar, CamWorks produces intuitive cam software integrated directly into the SOLIDWORKS CAD environment where machinists can save hours of programming time through capabilities like associativity with the CAD model, automatic feature recognition, and the ability to capture and reuse best practices. So thanks again to CamWorks for their support this year. Our next segment is one we imagine you've all been waiting for. Whether you know him from the Daytona 500 or the Dakar Rally, driver Robbie Gordon has made a name for himself in more ways than one. My colleague Tim Newton recently caught up with Robbie and senior engineer Daniel Granger to discuss their team's efforts in building the next generation of vehicles for off-road racing. I'm so excited to introduce to you the legendary racer Robbie Gordon and his chief designer Daniel Granger. So they've been engineering the future of off-road and have just released the Speed UTV. Let's start with you, Robbie. Where are you joining uh, from today? Well, currently I'm in the, uh, the workshop area here at Speed UTV. As you see, we have one of the race cars behind me over here on the left. And on the right, we've got one of the production cars. Um, both these cars were at the sand show. The one on the right um, might be a little bit um, funny because at Sand Sports, it was upside down. So we turned it into our stage at Sandsport, but that was to allow the enthusiasts, customers, fans, et cetera, to see the bottom side of the car. Because normally when a car company comes out with a car, you know, it looks really good on the outside, but underneath it may be not so nice. Uh, what we want to show is the quality all the way through the car where people can touch it and feel it and not have to get on the hands and knees. We just roll the car over instead of, um, instead of having people to climb down on their knees and look underneath the car. Now, super cool demonstration. We, we loved it. Can you tell us, for those of you who don't, haven't followed your career, it's been a long one in a lot of different disciplines, which I always thought was a really cool thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into racing and then maybe some of the classes that you were, you've been involved with? Yeah, I, I started um, you know, racing on the West Coast over in Southern California, Orange County area. Um, typical you know, um, wannabe racer. Um, Started with BMX and was able to hone those skills to convince my father to let me do some motocross. Uh, from motocross turned into off-road and as soon as I climbed in an off-road car, we had very early success. Um, went in the, the Baja 1000, Vegas, Torino, um, numerous off-road races uh, and raced in a series called Mickey Thompson Off-Road. Um, that is a, a similar, series to what I have with Stadium Super Truck, um, but it's a series that Mickey Thompson started back in the uh, 80s, and I ended up being the 1989 Mickey Thompson champion. Uh, in 2000, I signed up with Ford Motor Company to race their Baja trucks and do some Mickey Thompson stuff and some sports car stuff. So I got introduced to Jack Roush, and my career took a very fast turn when we won the 24 Hours of Daytona in our very first race. Uh, from there, we turned into a, a sports car racer. Um, within you know 12 months of that, I was sitting in Chip Ganassi's and AJ Foyt's Indy cars. So um, fast, fast track career from off road through Indy car. We started Stadium Super Truck in 2013. Uh, from Stadium Super Truck, uh, now we have a, a series that's very similar to IROC, uh, probably one of the most watched motorsports. Uh, events now on social media because of the high flying two wheel three wheel action. Um, the competition is very close. We've got a we've got a formula that works very well uh, that puts on very good exciting post finish races because the trucks have what we call opposite arrow, which make racing really fun. Um, during that time, uh, about the beginning of my NASCAR career, we designed a vehicle called the Polaris RZR, Robbie's Ride. Um, Fast forward there, 2022, and we have our 2023 model Speed UTV right here behind you, that behind me that we introduced to the public here at Sand Sports just a few weeks ago. So not only are we still in the racing side of the business, we're also in the manufacturing side, and that's where 
you know, the guys like Daniel, Daniel Granger and, and the relationship with Hawk Ridge and SolidWorks comes into play because this is something when you get into manufacturing, we were using SolidWorks uh, quite a bit with our NASCAR and stadium super truck design. But once we got into Speed UTV, um, that design platform changed a lot. And with the help of Hawk Ridge, it helped us advance our technology of, of design technology and be able to use these products to get into actual production of, of, of vehicles and mass production in those kind of numbers. Robbie, I can confirm the stadium super trucks are the biggest spectacle in motorsports today. I mean, the way they come out of the, the corners on three wheels with that front wheel, you know, two feet off the ground and then jumping 15 feet high in the air, uh, super entertaining stuff. It's not just you out there either, right? You've got your son participating not only in super trucks, but also in the development of the UTV to some extent. Is that right? Yeah, Max has obviously been involved in our stadium super truck series. Um, you know, I, the same super truck um, is for me was a, was a series. How do we bring young racers into the fold again? You know, if you look at Mickey Thompson, where I came from, um, the likes of Rick Mears uh, came through Mickey Thompson. Then, then I came through Mickey Thompson as well as a guy by the name of Rob McCaffrey, who's a a very professional off-road racer with multiple Baja wins. We all came out of the Mickey Thompson series, but following myself out of Mickey Thompson was Jimmy Johnson. So Jimmy Johnson launched his career from Mickey Thompson. Casey Mears launched his career from Mickey Thompson. And then once Stadium Super Truck happened, the NASCAR truck champion from a couple of years ago, Sheldon Creed, was, was our two-time past champion prior to that. And then we got Matt Brabham coming through the series. Uh, but Ari Leyendijk has raced in Stadium Super Truck. Ricky Johnson's raced in Stadium Super Truck. Uh, Kyle LaDuke has, has raced in Stadium Super Truck. We've had multiple off-road, supercross, um, multi-champions through many different facets of motorsports have come and raced in Stadium Super Truck, which I'm really proud of, and I think it's a great series. You know, your experience in off-road racing really puts you in a unique position to bring a product like this to market. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the UTV and, and you know what's different about it compared to other things in the market today? Well, I think you know with the Speed UTV, the, the biggest thing is it was designed by a racer, um, and you know a lot of people um, question you know can we do this and are we capable to do this? But we did connect up with a very large manufacturer, and we've got ourselves in a really good position to to build parts. And as you look, uh, three years from the time of um, concept. We've got actual production cars here, as you saw at Sand Sports. And this is a complete design from what we call the tires touching the ground to the shock absorbers, to the suspension, to the chassis, to the body, the engine, the gearbox. Uh, all these components has been, have been designed. Um, Daniel has pretty much touched all those parts with his team, as well as um, have been designed here at this North Carolina facility through the helps of different companies like Albans or Mtron or, or Push Turbo or Tap Clutch or Arrington Engines with our engine. We have we have really grouped up with a bunch of uh, very strong, capable companies that could help us do our job. So not only like we hooked up with Hawk Ridge to help us with the, the technology to be able to do our job, we hooked up with the engineering side of things with, with very strong, um, long history in motorsport companies to help us build a high performance vehicle that could be a production vehicle. I think what we have here is we got a company that is used to building IndyCars, NASCAR, Dakar Rally, Baja 1000 cars, and we're actually scaling down to build a UTV where you have companies like Polaris and Kawasaki and, and Can-Am, they come from the quad and motorcycle industry and they're building up to a UTV. So it's kind of, we're going this direction. I feel they're going that direction. We kind of, we meet right here in the middle. And I think uh, competition is going to be very fierce with the, the big manufacturers in the, in the competition side of the UTV, as well as in the sales and marketing side. Thanks. Super exciting project. Um, let's talk a little bit about the team. Can you tell us about the team that are working on the design? Yeah, well, Daniel Granger, who um, you've already done one meet with, um, is the is the technical director on the project this is something this has been his his first major project out of school and i can't tell you how proud i am for the job that he's done um he has he has taken the commitment here and basically put his life on hold to build this car and 
you know, it happened during COVID. So, you know, in, in one sense, it allowed Daniel and myself to work hand in hand together um, to take the ideas from, you know, 30 years of motorsport racing and his experience from college and Baja SAE and working with you guys at SolidWorks on all the FEA and different things. He, Daniel has assembled a team around him with Kyle, Jason, and Jeff. He's got a group of guys here that help him as well as outside engineering firms that help us as far as Arrington Engines. You know, Tony, uh, Tony Cola may not be an engineer, but he is a very, very experienced engine guy that has, you know, four or five, dec four decades of high performance engine building. Um, you know, we're able to connect him with the guys over at Weddle Transmission who hooked us up, Ron Weddle hooked us up with the guys from Albans, who we've had a relationship with through all of our Dakar stuff and Baja stuff. And we're able to use their their engineering and expertise, as well as um, guys like Matt and Jeff, who worked with us in the beginning of the project and helped us ramp this project up to where we're at today, where we're, we're basically into production. Awesome. Daniel, I got to ask, I mean, this has got to be a dream job for you. I mean, it, it kind of would be for me. How, how'd you get connected with Robbie? How'd the, how'd the whole thing start? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is um, the craziest dream job I could have imagined. And... It's really funny how it started was I was browsing on Instagram, as I do, and I fall, I've been following Robbie Gordon for years, and he had a post said, looking for engineers, send your resumes here. And so I was actually talking to my roommate, Jeff, about it, and he said, dude, you'd be crazy if you don't apply, because uh, he had seen me doing all my work uh, throughout my university career with the Baja SAE team. Uh, where we designed and built a little single-seater off-road race car from scratch. And uh, so I put it together a little application with some lots of photos of uh, the projects that we've done and the cars I've built and sent it in. And I got a call a couple days later and said, hey, we like what you got. Come come check us out. So, so you move, right? You change, yeah. change your address. You jump right yeah. all Load, the way in. Loaded up my truck and drove four days across the continent and uh, showed up in North Carolina. He said, be here on Monday. I showed up on Monday and uh, the rest is history. Unbelievable. So this was about 36 months ago when this all kind of kicked off. Is that correct? Yeah. So I joined uh, basically the summer of 2019 and the first project was actually the trophy truck. Uh, we converted that to all wheel drive and uh, basically from July to about September, October, we were fully on the trophy truck. And then uh, we launched the concept of us doing this uh, speed UTV at Sand Sports in 2019. And then basically turned on the switch to that uh, December to January 2020. And since then, so it's just been a few months less than three years since we really started in the design of it. And uh, here we are today. So Robbie mentioned, you know, tires, the suspension, and all of it. How many parts have you developed, and 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 how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh, pretty crazy, and uh, it's pretty awesome to be able to have this much influence on this many parts and this variety of parts. Uh, because in school, you always hear people go work for an OEM, and their first job out of school is you get to design a door handle or a side mirror a hinge, or something, right? Yeah. Uh, exactly. And so uh, with Robbie, though, it's uh, pretty amazing because he's built all these cars, race cars from scratch over the years. He has built this, uh, you know, huge base of knowledge on what it needs to make any one of these individual parts work. And he's there to offer guidance and constraints on what the function of any one of these parts needs to do. And basically, it's up to me to then take his design goals and put it into, into SolidWorks, into 3D data, do some analysis, and then we'll start building prototypes. But uh, it's really about the design process. And that's something I can credit uh, my school and Baja SE program with, is they really emphasize with us is it's not about how to solve an individual problem. It's just how to solve problems and approach them with a methodical uh, method uh, that you can work through step by step, and then you can you can take on any problem, any any challenge. The development timeline seems so short to me, but I, I don't really know how does that compare to 
you know. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, it's It was definitely ambitious taking this on and uh, publicly as we did uh, basically live streams right from the start. So other companies will do three, four, five years of development on a new project in secret. Then maybe they'll announce it with some teasers and say coming next year. Um, we basically launched it in 2019, the concept. And then I think early 2020, we started doing these weekly live stream presentations where we updated our customers and our, our fans and followers and brought, us, brought them along with us uh, along the design process every step of the way. And uh, it's been pretty cool to be able to show them from our early concepts and how they evolved over just the design process and putting everything together in 3D. And then we build our first prototypes and we take those out and do testing. Then you learn so much the first time you build one um, in real life. And then the next stage after the, you've got your working prototype that you're happy with is, is adapting that and stepping it up to the mass manufacturing mm. and working with suppliers to provide not just one or two, but thousands uh, at a time. And so that's been uh, quite a challenge, but it's been very exciting to go through that whole process. That was kind of wild how you kind of live streamed a lot of it, right? Design is often done behind closed doors. You know, you, you don't see the concepts until the spy photos, right? When they're all cloak and dagger and, and everything. But you guys brought it right out in front of everybody. Were you able to take input from, um, you know, the, the public and incorporate that into the design? Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, did uh, actually live phone calls and took live questions from our customers at the end of every show uh, for quite a quite a number of months in the early stages. And we actually got quite a few good calls of, you know, adding uh, adding a feature here, adding a feature there, or what are you thinking about this? And then uh, Robbie and I would talk after the show and say, oh, that was a great idea. Actually, maybe we should look at that, or maybe they don't know quite so much what they're talking about. But uh, it was it was really cool to have that uh, collaborative effort with the customers and uh, bring them along and, and involve them in the design process. Can you highlight some of the challenges that you encountered along the way? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of the challenges uh, that were surprises to me, I think, was just uh, basically this last stage of, uh, you know, with the tools that SolidWorks and Hawkwidge provide us, uh, we were able to work super quick and efficiently getting from our you know initial concepts and uh, prototypes and, and building the first iteration of what we want the part to be. But the biggest challenge uh, that I think was was the last step of getting everything put together in mass manufacturing quantities and ensuring that all the tolerances were all correct and specified that all these systems would work together and in mass quantities. For the nerds out there, highlight some of the differences between you know what you're doing today versus what's on the market. You know, I know you've got some parts in front of you. We talked a little bit about bearings. Can you share a couple of the unique features? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a couple uh, great features that are unique to us, and thanks to some of Robbie's patents, are, are going to always be unique to us. Um, a big one of which is uh, how our suspension couples to each other in the spindles. So. Uh, a normal vehicle will use uh, like a ball joint, uh, which is usually a tapered fit ball pivot, um, and it's mounted in single shear. Whereas what we used in, in off-road racing, uh, we call it a spherical bearing or a monoball. Uh, but essentially what it is, is you've got a single ball that the pivot is on, and it's supported on an outer race, and that will connect to your control arm. And then the outside of a bolt will go through both sides and shoulder into your spindle. So this allows us to distribute the suspension load and the shock load uh, through both sides. And so you don't have any forces trying to bend the bolt. Um, it's just loading it uh, in shear. And to take care of any shear loading on threads, we've actually got a patent on bolts and nuts where the actual shank of the bolt, so the unthreaded portion, um, extends past where the bolted flanges are, and then our nut countersinks and swallows the thread. 
So these are all technologies that um, you know Robbie has developed through his years and career of, of racing and building off-road vehicles that we're able to implement as kind of a no-brainer to us on, on a production vehicle uh, just because we're coming from that racing background. Robbie, did you learn that all the hard way? We've, uh, we definitely learned that the hard way. You know, we started um, learning this process a long time ago in the beginning, back when they had like Ford I-beams and we had a kingpin. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, how do we make this structure work and be strong enough without having a ball joint? And that's where we figured out bigger monoballs, high misalignment spacers, and being able to get articulation out of a, a monoball, which catches everything in double shear. And obviously the bigger diameter monoball with a, with a reduced spacer inside following the ball radius, we could learn that we could get it to rotate and be connected on both sides, which was double shear was always way stronger than just hanging out there in single shear. So Daniel, I've watched Robbie race the Dakar Rally. I'm, I'm a fan. I, I watch that stuff. I love it. I love the passion too, Robbie, that you have out there. I think it's phenomenal how you wear your heart on your sleeve and you come out with your true thoughts swinging, and right? feelings. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Daniel, how, how do you design for such forces that a guy like Robbie is going to definitely put these things into at every opportunity? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's really a challenging task, honestly. And, uh, an analogy I like to make when we're setting up these these design constraints is, you know, our buddies are in school. I used to say our buddies over at Formula SAE, but now we could say our buddies in Formula One. They know that their car can corner around this constant radius turn and corner at two Gs or three Gs, and you can calculate all the load on on each suspension component going up through that. Now we have to say, sure, we could go be going around that same corner at that same speed. But there might be a massive rock in the middle of it. <laughs> or we might drop off a ledge and land and land on one wheel. So uh, you really have to um, have an idea of what your loading cases are, but then you give yourself a little bit bigger of a safety factor uh, for those those rocks and those unexpected incidents. Uh, but then again, you can deflect back to Robbie's uh, RWE, as he call it, calls it, which is real world experience and uh, because if you just safety factored everything, you'd have the heaviest car, it wouldn't break, but it also wouldn't go anywhere. So there's definitely a fine balance between learning what's light enough and strong enough that it'll survive. And so really our design case that we try and look at uh, when we go through all these parts to say, is it good enough, is we think, will this survive the Baja 1000? And so the Baja 1000 is a, a thousand mile race over the gnarliest terrain in, uh, in Mexico. And we, we use that as kind of a benchmark, not just for you know, impacts, but also endurance. We want all of our components to be able to try and last that long as, as our goal to um, have survivable uh, parts. Man, that, that's awesome. Robbie, so at the... Sandsport Super Show, it was the first time the public actually could probably come out, touch, feel. I've seen some of the footage. I mean, you guys were swamped with folks. From your perspective, was it a great success? It looked like it. It was a very good success. I think, um, you know, we got criticized the year before when we bought, brought our first pre-production cars out. Uh, those were just, as, they, as it sounds, those were pre-production cars. And, and we got criticized by people on either the quality of the fit and finish or the quality and welds. And that really uh, made Daniel and myself, you know, check ourselves and make sure that everything was perfect. And, you know, it took us, we made, you know, door mold changes. We made uh, fixture mold changes. We, we taught robots how to weld better. Um, for the next, you know, 10, 12 months with all the rigorous testing that we did, we also taught these, these processes to be better so that we could have a, a proper fit and finish car. And I'm really proud of what we have today. I think we've got something that is, is the, the leader in the industry as far as quality goes. And um, we're working really hard on the fit and finish as well. How about the performance? I know you've been at the Nora 500, how'd it go? Well, the, uh, the race car didn't go so well, so that was a, a bit of a disappointment. But to be honest with you, you know, even though it didn't go well, we learned so much uh, because the part that failed on that production race car was something that's on all the production cars. So we immediately came back, we designed, Jason designed a tool 
we were able to modify our air oil separators so that we can continue to go to production with our current parts that we already had and prevent this problem from ever happening again. So again, we jumped right into SolidWorks as soon as we got back from to the shop. Uh, Jason designed up a part, Jesse machined it up on the uh, on the Haas CNCs, and we heated it up and we pressed it together. And as people will see on our show this week, we made a quick fix on a production part that doesn't hurt the part in any way, shape or form, but it prevents the line from coming off like it did. And that was just a tooling mistake that got made. And there is mistakes to get made, but what I, what I believe we're really good at is finding a very fast solution on how to fix the problems. And that's the same way we've always been with racing. If your car doesn't handle right, you do this just quick. If you got a problem on the race reliability, you make a change for the next week so it doesn't happen again. So I think the, um, the NASCAR, IndyCar rigorous schedule taught us to be very efficient on time and how not to waste time. And that's the same thing we're doing with our production vehicle stuff. A little RWE, as Daniel says. Oh, Quick course correct. correction. And then, uh, and then uh, some backyard engineering mixed with some, some real life engineering with, with you guys at SolidWorks and, and Jason and Daniel and, and Jeff and all the guys. And boom, we got a fix. And we're able to not slow the process down. You know, this was probably going to be a, a six to eight week delay. Um, but it was something that we could make a tool and fix the parts that we had and not uh, not 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 really get too big of a delay. Oh, very cool. I, you know, I have to ask, Robbie, why'd you choose SolidWorks? Well, I think um, one of the reasons I choose SolidWorks, there's, there's, a, there's other choices out there, but, you know, what I, what I want to do is bring young guys into the sport, um, eager, hungry, that didn't have bad habits, that didn't have, well, we did it this way over here at Ford, or we did it this way at Chevrolet. I really wanted to have young engineers that we could share our experience with, teach them and allow them to show us what they're good at. And SolidWorks is, is pretty common through most colleges. There's a lot of good colleges that have good SolidWorks programs, even high schools. You know, we work with, um, with a high school there in Southern California with Jeff Wallace that they use SolidWorks at that school, at high school level. So it's a, it's a simple process that we can actually build a production vehicle using the, the SolidWorks tools. And I think it's uh, probably the easiest way and the fastest way to uh, to a production vehicle. Awesome. Or solve guys, a I problem. Got, I got to tell you, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been an honor for me to, to speak with you guys and learn more about the Speed UTV. Where can everybody learn more about Speed UTV? We've got our, our Facebook page, Speed UTV. Uh, there's an owner's group on there for pre-ordered customers. Uh, they like to get together and discuss. Uh, we have our YouTube channel, Speed UTV, uh, as well as Instagram. And you can always stay up to date on, on Robbie's Instagram, uh, Robbie Gordon, and that's where you'll get some extra bonus sneak peeks that I'll post at 2 or 3 a.m. when he's out doing something cool. Uh, so definitely stay tuned on there. Sounds good. I'll definitely tune in. I can't wait to talk to you guys next time. Thank well, you, Robbie. Thank you, and thank you Daniel. You guys, thank, thank you. you. And, and like I said, um, you know, I know this is brought to us by Hawk Ridge and SolidWorks, but uh, we would definitely not be able to do this project without the tools they offer. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks again, Tim. And thanks to Robbie Gordon and his team for giving us that insider look at the way engineering and racing have come together. The number of tasks required to build something like an off-road vehicle from scratch sounds almost beyond count, with a lot of tools needed to put it all together. We covered some of those tools in today's program of breakout sessions. Let's take a minute to look back at some of the content that our Hawker Systems team put together.
you're like me, chances are we had more content scheduled during today's breakout sessions than you had time for. But not to worry, we'll be posting full recordings of each session to the Hawkridge Systems YouTube channel over the coming weeks. I'll be taking the time to watch Kanan Iron's presentation on the new robust print mode that's been introduced for HP's 5200 3D printer. That session was made possible by HP, who are once again serving as a D2M Platinum sponsor. Combining the strengths of large build volumes with their impressive multi-jet fusion technology, HP enables the manufacture of highly detailed parts at some incredible speeds. Our customers and partners have been making parts with HP for years, and with the recent release of their powder-based HP Metal Jet technology, we're excited to see what they'll be able to produce on today's shop floor and beyond. Now, our next speaker this afternoon is somebody whose daily work in the field of nonprofit surgery is something that should truly humble us all. From Sign Fracture Care, please help me give a warm welcome to engineering manager Terry Smith. Hey, Terry, thanks again for taking some time out of your day to spend it with us. Um, tell us about Sign Fracture Care and the work that you do. What's your mission? Thanks, Damon. And it's, uh, it's great to be here and to uh, talk to the group. Uh, Sign Fracture Care, we are an, uh, a nonprofit medical device company. And I know that's, that's kind of a bit of an oxymoron, right? Nonprofit medical device, but we design, manufacture, and then distribute orthopedic implants and surgical instruments that are used to treat the injured poor throughout the world. And so our mission is to provide the same type of uh, what we call fracture care or treating of. Uh, you know, long bone fractures that you could receive here in the U.S. And uh, so we also provide education to the surgeons that uh, we support. And so through that process where you're trying to develop the implants, the surgical instruments, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and train the surgeons in the field to use this stuff, what is that, what does that process look like? How do you decide what you need to design and, and figure out that it's, it's going to be a practical design? Where does that begin? Our design process is um, we use you know, a stage gate or phase gate uh, process to develop our devices. And the initial phase is where we're trying to understand what problem we're solving, you know, where's the need. Uh, and uh, in, that, in that phase, we're doing a lot of conceptualizations. Maybe we're doing mock-ups with uh, hand sketches, CAD, you know, SOLIDWORKS models, 3D printed models. Uh, just trying to understand, you know, what what the real problem is, and you know, and obviously, like everybody doing design work and product development, is you're building those models and the concepts and doing your ideation. You're understanding the real needs that's going on with those devices. So um, we'll take those uh, concepts and ideas and slowly evolve that into a, a formal design, um, and then as we come out of that phase. Right, we have uh, gates that we have to cross, and we're doing that because there's some out. Some of our output is the because the FDA and ISO, we're putting that output into that design output into specific formats that we can and satisfying some of those regulatory needs with that. Um, then we roll into what we call a design uh, and process development phase, where we're really this is where we're honing in on a final design. The whole team's decided, like, yeah, this is a product we want to support. We're really pulling in manufacturing at a higher level, at a more detailed level, and our quality team, so that they're, you know, not only are we doing the design iterations with them to do producibility and inspection, we're talking about training, what's going to occur, how would we use this to train, what are, you know, what are the shipping logistics pieces of it, all the basic product development stuff that goes on. So we're, we're doing that um, with the broader team and getting their input. We kind of, it feels like, a, we call it a design tornado because sometimes it, you know, I'd love to tell you it's super smooth and we're really good at this and, and it just, everything happens, but it can be, you know, it can be chaotic as you're like, you headed down a path, you get input from somebody that changes that path. And so, uh, or we're doing testing and we realize, hey, you know, um, as you, you know, as happens, right? It works well on paper or in 3D, but uh, models, but then you start to do the real testing and you start realizing, or you're doing the real manufacturing, you start realizing that, that there are constraints coming up that you need to work on. Um, and uh, so we'll take that effort. And as we're developing the design, manufacturing or our suppliers, they are also uh, developing their processes, whether it's 
fixturing or tooling, say for machine parts, uh, however they're going to inspect it, you know, programs, inspection programs. So all of that's going on. It's, it's pretty typical product development efforts that you do. Um, and then that uh, will start to wrap up with testing. So we have to prove to the, you know, ISO FDA, what they really want from you is tell me what you're going to design, right? Go design it and then show me that you designed it uh, and met the needs and uh, of what you it started out with. So it's it, at a really high level, their requirements are pretty simple. And so we just make sure we're satisfying that. At the, like I said, at the end of our development phase, we're doing testing, we're doing a pilot run uh, of devices. So everybody gets a chance within our, whether it's design, manufacturing, quality, even shipping, everybody gets a chance to, to do the initial hands-on with those, uh, their individual processes. And then we roll that feedback from that effort back into a final design that's transferred to production. Yeah, it's definitely true that, you know, certain regulatory requirements and, and process requirements that can add a lot of work, but it's still really important to get that feedback, I'm sure, and early in the process and keep that kind of iterative flow moving. As you've gone through this before, you, you know, come up with a concept, you do some 3D printing to get a prototype and, and test it out. What are some of the challenges you had encountered in the past and then overcome? Part of the surgical process is the surgeon needs to ream by hand down the center of a bone canal. So the, the long bones, the femur, the tibia, the humerus, they all have a canal down the center of the bone. And part of the surgical process is the surgeon reams that out so that he can place a stainless steel rod down the center of that bone. Because his goal is to, to um, stabilize the fracture. And that is, that is the method that they're using with our devices. So we did a lot of testing with a new reamer design. And the goal of that new reamer was to be able to have it be able to be resharpened by the hospitals. That's, uh, they don't have, you know, in a, in a simple manner, they don't, not, not all the hospitals have the ability to, to resharpen their devices. So we needed something very simple to do that. We also wanted to be able to collect uh, the bone graft material is they're reaming out the center of the bone. They want, we want them to be able to collect that bone graft material so that they can use it and pack it back into fracture site. And that helps promote bone healing. Well, we did, you know, conceptualized, designed a you know, really nice reamer. We did a bunch of testing and uh, on simple wooden blocks. Oak is a, is analogous to reaming bone. You can drill and ream oak and it's, it's, um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close uh, to what will what you feel in doing that. And during that process, you know, we took a lot less torque to run this reamer. It was really a great, you know, we thought, man, this is awesome. The best thing you get, we do a small pilot run, we get it in the field, and the surgeons are like, hey, this we get really tired from this. We went back and looked at it and um, realized the shape of the canal that it took a lot more effort to push on the reamer to get it through where the first reamer we had it pulled itself down the canal so we had to change the design and we had this stark realization that our testing was oversimplified and so we used solidworks uh to take and extract a, the bone canal out of uh, out of a ct scan so we have software that we're able to export the ct scan geometry into solidworks we're able to take that canal uh, create some, I'll call them somewhat idealized surfaces that um, then we could take a wooden block and machine it, half of a canal on one side of the wooden block, the other half on the, on the other side, and then put it together. Um, and then you could ream down the center in between that. And so you had a realistic bone canal that we, were, we could test with. And so then we had in, hooked up instrumentation, measured torque, measured the effort to push it down the canal. Um, and just so... Uh, that was probably one of the uh, one of the challenges where SolidWorks really helped us out, right? So we could taking that export and importing it and idealizing those surfaces allowed us to do make some uh, custom test parts um, for for us to solve that problem. Oh, that's like reverse engineering to prototyping to testing, like right. all in one cycle. There, very right. very, very cool stuff. Is, is it my understanding yes. that you also have used simulation? to sort of predict the performance of, of a test fixture when you're, when you're trying out some of these surgical instruments. Is that right? Yeah, you know, we use simulation uh, really to analyze our implants. Probably the, that's the most often. Uh, some of the implants that we do are uh, 
there's ASTM uh, test standards, uh, and so we will do uh, simulation for those. Um, part of our the design constraints uh, or design requirements with our implants are they're considered load sharing, and so and what that means is is we don't want the implant to carry 100% of the load. So if a person's walking, we need the bone structure to also carry part of that load. That promotes the bone healing process. So we will, you know, so designing an implant, you, you know, we need to understand stiffness uh, and strength. And so trying to find the right compliance between that uh, and what the bone is. So we will do some analysis around that. Um, we also, as we have a couple of the parts where, uh, there's some high stress areas and during manufacturing, if you get uh, a part that may be undersized and right at, you know, maybe under spec, but you're trying to understand it, could we use that uh, and do that disposition? And so we'll do an analysis to see if that uh, um, is, if those devices have enough strength uh, left in them. And uh, so, yeah, lots of, lots of ways we'll use simulation, R really more structural, uh, in aspect. We'll also, as we do uh, testing, we have a nice Instron test equipment. So as we're doing uh, structural testing, we like to be able to predict that with our, some simulation also to try to, uh, to calibrate the models, right? So we're doing some iteration there while we're doing that. It's really impressive, like how many angles you have examined all of these use cases from. It's like you're exploring all sides of it. At the end of the day, what impact do you think all that effort has had on your patients? Oh, you know, there's, we're approaching 400,000 patients, right? So sign has been, uh, we have been designing and building implants and shipping them out for, uh, you know, over 22 years, right? And uh, so we are approaching 400,000 patients that we've helped throughout that time period. And uh, for, like I said at the beginning, for, for those, a lot of those, they had fractures where they thought that they were going to be disabled for the rest of their life. They don't always have access to quality orthopedic care uh, it, without a signed hospital. Uh, we provide um, the capability for those surgeons to, to do surgeries that they normally wouldn't be able to do. Uh, there's lots of kind of factors in that, anywhere from power quality that they have at their hospitals to the ability for them to buy uh, you know, expensive x-ray machines that are used during surgery. Uh, our system is very manual. so. The impact has is, is been uh, pretty great. We see that every day in cases that come in, uh, emails from surgeons. So yeah, uh, I think for those people we've helped, it's been very impactful. It's, it's honestly a, a privilege that, that we get to hear this kind of side of the, the healthcare story from you and, and, and feel connected in some way to that. I think it's a mission you really should be proud of and, and we're proud to have been a part of it. Thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us today. Oh, you bet. Thanks, Damon. And uh, yeah, we love uh, the support we get from SolidWorks and Dassault. It's been, they've, for years they've been doing it and uh, it's, you know, you are a part of our mission and, and have been, helped us to be very successful in our endeavor. Thanks again, Terry. Yep, thank you. Thanks again to Terry Smith. It's fascinating to see design tools and 3D printers being used not only to develop products, but to validate them for surgery environments all around the world. Speaking of which, we'd like to take a moment to thank our partner, Mark Forge, who were kind enough to be a sponsor for that interview with Terry and the rest of this year's conference. Mark Forge has a platform of industrial 3D printers with the software and materials to enable the printing of, of strong and functional end use parts. In addition to the new FX20 printer that you may have heard about, they've made some exciting additions to the material family in the last year, including ELA and Ultem and their latest release, TPU95, which fills a need in the market for high-quality elastic parts. So great news for anyone who's been waiting to print their own phone case. Now, our final speaker this afternoon is on a mission, unlike many others, he's putting in the work to make the dream of personalized human flight a reality. Uh, coming to us from their recently held Demo Day conference on the East Coast, please help me welcome Hao Wu, co-founder and CEO of Exavalar Industries. Hey, good day to you, Hal. Thank you so much for taking some time to uh, speak with us today and, and introduce yourself to uh, the Oakridge Systems team. Um, I just got to start off by asking, you know, many of us have seen the famous footage of jetpack concepts from the 1960s and, um, you know, 
future promises of like personalized human flight, what made you want to, to build on that legacy and finally make it a reality? Yeah, yeah. Taking on uh, a challenge like this is uh, pretty atypical, I I'd say, for uh, for college graduate. So I started the company right after I uh, received my master's in mechanical engineering. So I was um, we're seeing a rise in human air mobility in general. So there are jetpacks are flying. Uh, there are eVTOLs being built. Joby Aviation and uh, smaller companies that are ch companies in China that's building personal eVTOL. And drones are popping up everywhere where the utility in air is becoming more and more ubiquitous. Like we can do things in air now. And when I saw people flying jetpacks uh, on YouTube, basically, and I was like, hmm, we can fly now, but we cannot really use our hands and uh, while we are flying. So that was my thought. What if we can use our hands when we are flying? And wouldn't that be more useful? So I set it out um, to design a system that allows a person to fly hands-free. And the goal is to make the system useful, utilitarian for human and robotics flight, and ultimately to create this workspace in the sky that we can design and build beyond our imagination. That's an interesting point. It, that's something that is unique about your system. Why do you believe that having a hands-free flight system is so important? We do so many things on the ground. Like we, we are up until this point, we're constrained by gravity. And we, we build so much stuff by interacting with our surroundings, interacting with our tools, um, just building from the ground up, using heavy equipment or handheld equipment, or whatever. But just imagine if we could do that in air, like what, what can we build in the future if we can have the superpower of flight and we can use, we can do the same things we do on the ground, but also in the air. So that is the higher level logic behind it. You've clearly been working through a lot of concepts to try to meet that design challenge. Can you share your latest project with us? Yeah, yeah, we, we call it uh, Project Obsidian. It's a hands-free human flight exoskeleton. Similar to how uh, SpaceX lands rockets, we use thrust vectoring to balance a human in air uh, with propulsion located in the lower body. So we have the entire upper body reserved for utility, basically. You can attach different things to your upper body. If a human is flying, you can use tools. If a robot is flying, you can attach robotic arms, sensors, uh, whatever actuators on the robot to do different things in air. And uh, yeah, but basically it's a, a point in the sky that you can attach different components to it, it's modular, and it flies. Makes sense that there's a, a huge benefit from, from, as you mentioned, the thrust vectoring technology and the ability to, to use software to help stabilize flight you know, in, in sort of an automatic way. Um, on the mechanical side, what are some of the challenges that you have come across during the design process and, and getting this product to a prototype? On the mechanical side, like I, we just need parts and sometimes customize. Sometimes we need very standard parts that uh, just comes along. Uh, we, we, we order from McMaster car. They're a bit on the expensive side, but they come really quick. On um, the challenge is that when we need custom parts, like we have to design it in SOLIDWORKS and uh, I had to design in SOLIDWORKS and go, go through the entire life cycle of uh, sketching, building a model, uh, validating the design, see if there's interference or like if it is strong enough, and then uh, generate the two D uh, the step model and the plots and send it to manufacturing. I'm not very organized, so in the beginning, like the I was optimizing for a speed to prototype, and uh, the whole thing turned out to be a mess in the back end. 
but we ended up building the prototype anyways. So like it's straight off to, uh, to what the approach that I took, I mean, it was doing it really fast, just getting the model out, <laughs> getting to the manufacturer, but the process not very repeatable because, you know, I was doing it fast. Yeah. The, you mentioned that, you know, I think what you're describing is similar to what a lot of SOLIDWORKS users encounter using off the shelf parts from a supplier like McMaster while designing some custom parts around it, having to communicate with the manufacturer. What's it been like to collaborate with these different parties using SOLIDWORKS and using, as far as I understand, you're using some data uh, sharing capabilities on 3D experience. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I use uh, 3D experience for storage a lot that the, the content management made it easier for us to, uh, have organization in the backend. I don't lose things anymore and, uh, I can have better versioning. So that's what one thing I had. So we did iterations from uh, first prototype to second uh, 1.1. And that was, that's when we incorporated, uh, the 3d experience and try to use, um, some are more uh, on cloud design features that we had. So now the, we are, so we took a break from doing technical stuff in our company because I broke the last prototype and we decided to work on the business side, uh, a bit more. That's when we got into the, made all the progress with tech stars and you need a grant and everything. So now at this point, um, we're getting back into tech technical work and we just hired an engineer. He's very familiar with SOLIDWORKS, but he's not used, he has not used uh, 3D experience before. So going forward, I would probably expose him to the uh, 3D experience, the cloud experience, how that integrates with the workflow right now, because we are, what we're trying to do is we want to build up the process internally that anybody can come in and be very clear about what's going on and where the, where the stuff are and, uh, how do you go about doing work when the content is there, what's the goal and what is the timeline of doing things, that kind of stuff, project management and, uh, having all the resources linked in the same place for project management, if that makes sense. Of course. Yeah. I mean, just like anything, this is, uh, you know, this is going to be a process. I'm sure you're going to have prototypes and, and every step of the way in the design process, a new revision that you want to evaluate. I'm curious though, what, what was the feeling you had when you took that first sort of test, uh, test run on the prototype? Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, I was nervous and, uh, the, it's kind of, uh, uh, but I was really focused. And, uh, because there are so many things that can go wrong and I was really focused on like checking if the engine's on fire, if my leg is on fire, uh, and there's a, uh, um, if my emer emergency switch is in my line of sight and about for, for a second, when I got off, uh, in the air, that was, uh, more calming and smooth than I expected it to be because the engines, they sound very violent and they're hot, but the air they spit out is actually very smooth and you feel like you were walking on the cloud, but only for, uh, for us, it was a split second when we got off the ground and I was, um, hanging on to the, to the chain there in the tether system. As you mentioned, some challenges with, with reliability that will need to be worked out, but, but, uh, the experience was there, right? Um, how far would you, how far off would you say you are to, to seeing this kind of technology being used, you know, in the applications you described. Yeah. Yeah. So we are, uh, we have a few plans, uh, for, for regarding using this technology, the, the soonest we can get it out there is likely to be in sports or entertainment October next year. Like we should be able to fly and, uh, we will work very hard to make that happen. Of, of course, it's going to be a beta test for sports and entertainment purposes and people can come in and fly at our, uh, airport location. And, uh, and we have a wait list going for that. So it's called the Exo flight club. 
and uh, we thought it was a cool name, not a fight club, but a flight club. Instead of uh, not talking about it, we want you to talk about it, that kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, but on the B two B and B two G side, we also have plans because the vision is to really change the way we view human flight and provide making the sky a, a workspace for us. So there is definitely uh, angles in B two B in offshore wind uh, maintenance and operations, for example, or uh, utility grid maintenance, that kind of stuff going on. But that's a longer timeline. Well, I, I'm sure as you continue to work on this project that people certainly will uh, be talking about it, especially uh, as we see you start to use this in, in the applications you're talking about, sporting events and, and utility repair. We wish you all yeah. the best of luck. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today and, and uh, Good luck on all your future efforts. Thank you. Amazing stuff. I don't think it's a stretch to say that taking on the trials of something as bold as jetpack design would not be possible without effective engineering tools. So it's encouraging to see a company like Exavalar using these solutions from our partner Dassault Systems, who, by the way, are once again serving as a platinum sponsor for this year's events. Force DS offers a complete suite of software that engineers and manufacturers use to streamline the entire product development process with solutions from the brands you all know, including SolidWorks, 3D Experience, Simulia, and Katia. These tools have helped teams of all sizes design, analyze, manage, and manufacture world-changing products more efficiently. So thanks again to Desso for all the support they always provide. Now we're coming to the end of our afternoon program, but before we go, it's time for us to keep a promise and award some prizes to three lucky attendees of D2M in motion. We've done an impartial raffle and drawn a few names. So with that, let's reveal the winners. Receiving the third place prize, an OM5 portable smartphone mount from DJI, we have Donald Carter from Link Engineering and Design Incorporated. Can't wait to see where we go with that one, Donald. Hold on. Our second place prize is the XARM 1S, which is a fully programmable robotic arm with six degrees of freedom. And yes, you can code it from your phone or a laptop. Uh, so taking that one home will be Alexander Abram from Ergonomic Products. Uh, and finally, our first place prize should be an exciting one for any fans of Animal Crossing. The winner of the Nintendo Switch is Scott Crawford from Toe Hall. So congratulations again to our winners. Thanks to them for playing. Thanks to all of you for joining this, us this year for D2M in Motion. Whether you spent the day learning something new, meeting a new colleague, or maybe just getting some inspiration to nerd out, we hope you found your time at this year's conference well spent. Good luck to all of you in 2023, and we hope to see you next time at Hawkridge Systems D2M.